Um, yeah, so I guess the last question, and then I want to open it up. Actually, we're, we're going to show one more little um, video, and then I want to give you guys. But Grant, yeah. you're one of the most prolific storytellers in the world, and, and you've told so many different types of stories. You've tapped some of the great Western mythologies. That I w that's what I would call them in you know, Batman, Superman, X-Men, some of the brilliant stuff you've done. Can you talk a little bit about your, your process? your storytelling process and your story structure process because um, there's so many creators in this room, I'm sure, that would really just envy a little bit of a window into that. Well, I guess it's, uh, for me, it always, you know, you go to the source material, which whether it's Batman or whether it's Mahabharat, and you're trying to find the shape of it. And as I say, finding the shape in Mahabharat was difficult because it was done very differently from the way we tell stories. And it's not the three act structure and it's not all that Hollywood stuff. But it was the same way when I did Superman, you know, I thought of Superman as a solar god, so the structure of All-Star Superman, for instance, is circular. It's like a solar journey. It starts in the summer, it, and mid midway through it's in the winter, it's at night, and it winds up in the summer again. With Batman, it was a much more sprawling thing, but it was all based around the notion of clues and puzzles. So that came, became this, the, the spine of that story. And what I did with this one is, is based it around the notion that in the center of it is this, the Bhagavad Gita, is this revelation of, of cosmic knowledge. And for me, that was the ground zero of this story. And what I did was I built this one outwards like ripples because of the idea that what you have in the middle is this absolute cosmic vision. And just on the edges of that cosmic vision, you have these semi-divine beings who are acting in archetypal ways. So it builds out. And as I built it out, the further out from that central vision that you go in these ripples, the more human it becomes. So you start from the cosmic vision, then you go to giant figures fighting in a battlefield for the soul of mankind. And then you go to, well, what did that guy do last night when he, you know, he was hungry and he needed to go home and talk to his wife and take a piss? And you start to get into the, the people who've come closer and closer to this absolute moment. So the structure of this one for me was almost modular. I was building it in circles around the central idea. And again, it was very different. In fact, it's not even circles, it's more like a sphere around the central idea. If you can see a sphere around a central idea and draw it for me, please. <laughs> but it was that, so the structure of this one was much bigger and I thought it also allowed us to, to plug in. So you take the, you know, the, at the center, as I say, Bhagavad Gita, around it is this battlefield, this war of, of titans, and then around that there's human stories, and then at the very edge of it there's real human stories, there's the real deep down, here's how they got here, here's what they were like as children. And I, th I thought that what we could do is then add on anything, so you could continually add little modules of, oh, here's the story of, of Shantanu, or here's the story of King Pandu, who's the father of all these guys, who doesn't really do much in this because he's part of their past. But it meant that we could also explore that and continue, keep, just keep plugging on more pieces of the story. So for me, this was a very different way of thinking about structure. And that's always what makes it interesting. You know, finding the structure of a story is the kind of exciting bit for me because every one of them is, is very different. Just have one question for you too, Grant. Yeah. I mean, you have been, in many ways, I think, the, uh, the modern master of the superhero genre and you know, one of the most acclaimed creators. When you look at the future of the superhero, the Western superhero, you see these new story arcs and things emerging. I mean, yeah. where, where does it go from here? Have we seen, will the superhero as we know it always be there as a genre? And will we see other kind of influences from China, India? What do, where do you think it's all going? Well, I think it's certainly important. I mean, as we spoke about, and it's why I'm, I'm working with you guys again to also develop some new characters, hopefully. Yeah. But what I see here right now, I mean, I, the Marvel movies are really good. You know, I think they found a tone, but it's kind of the, it's the tone of, of 1970 Marvel comics. It's, you know, it's really perfect for superhero stories. The you know, Batman and Superman are a bit darker, a very different kind of thing. But what, I, what I'm seeing here in the West, and as someone who's been writing these things for a long time, there's a, there's a, a bit in the Martin Amos novel, The Information, where the lead character is this miserable writer, is writing a book called The History of Increasing Humiliation. And it's basically, <laughs> it's basically about how the, the hero figure in Western stories has degraded through time. So he says, you know, once we told stories about gods, then we started to tell stories about demigods. Then we told stories about heroes. 
Then we told stories about kings and princes. Then we told stories about burghers and merchants. Then we told stories about kind of ordinary people. And as he takes it through, he says, we, recently we had you know, existentialism, which is, that's the story of you. And then there's the story of me. But now the stories we're telling of, are of fuck-ups and mental cases and <laughs> murderers and failures. And so that's the history of increasing humiliation in Western storytelling. And I think right now we, we've got a kind of problem, and I'm sure we'll get through it because we get through most things. But the imagination in the West, its obsession with death and decay is becoming really boring to me. You know, if I see another fucking zombie, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> And I think that's our tragedy is that we, there's a certain feeling that this culture has fallen apart, that we're facing enemies we can't ultimately deal with, that our leaders are corrupt or idiotic or both, that our stars are idiots, that our models are bulimic mad women, that everything about us, you know, even the way we interact with each other on, online, is, 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 there's so much hatred, there's so much viciousness, there's so much misunderstanding, deliberate misunderstanding. And I think we've all, we're just having a bit of a nervous breakdown in our imagination. And all we can see now is death and disaster. You know, we're looking for, there is no future. Most of our stories are dystopias. Even the new Star Trek movie has to kind of, into darkness, you know, it's got to drag it into darkness. Superman has to kill now. And everyone's, this, this question has been asked constantly, should Batman kill, should Superman kill? Is this, look, killing is illegal and immoral. That's why heroes don't do it. <laughs> It's, you know, and this is simple, and these aren't relatable, but it's not relatable to, th should I kill this man or not? When do any of us ever have to ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope we never have to ask that question. And to put our heroes in the position where they have to ask that question, I see, again, it's a failure to me of a, the Western imagination, a kind of confrontation. We, we have no future, we don't know what to do with it. So I find quite interesting to go to cultures like in India or, or China, where there is a sense of the future and it's very different from the way we are feeling here and there is a sense that there's things ahead and that things are going to get better and that people are going to get richer and smarter and do more. And so I feel that the, the superhero is, is much more important for the East now. I think the superhero is losing his ground. Superhero worked best in America during the war when they, we had an enemy to fight and in the 60s and 50s when we were pioneering forward thinking people. The superhero embodies that and I don't know if the superhero works so well. The more he's been broken down, the more he's been treated as a soldier rather than as a hero. So I think that's what I find interesting about what you guys are doing. There's a real sense of that those emergent cultures in the East are actually looking for superhero figures. They're the people who can most use them right now. And in those cultures, I think the superhero will be much more positive than it's become in this culture. But that's just me. <laughs> and, and you heard it here first. <laughs> You heard it here first that, we, while we haven't announced it, we are working on Grant creating his first Indian superhero, which will be very reflective of the times of, of today. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys exciting, all so. see, like, why we love working with this guy <laughs> so much. And actually, that's why I want to open it up, because I want to yeah. give you guys an opportunity to ask a few questions. We just have about 10 minutes left. Um, so I think I see a mic on this side. And if you guys want to line up. I'm getting a real shocking headache, so if there's any telepaths in here, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like that bit in scanners when I... <laughs> <laughs> Go yep. for it, yeah. Hello, gentlemen. Sherrod, Grant, How Gotham. Uh, Aaron Levy, 1000mpg.com. And obviously there's like a million and ten things, having read the entire Invisibles, that I could ask or say to you. But based upon what you were saying, um, I view the main premise and problem facing the human species today is global energy. And my actual hope is in India, China, Korea, and Japan looking, speaking for the United States as sort of a collapsed, fallen, broken empire turned mercenary empire. And you could say it was an accidental empire, being that we won the Second World War and, you know, 
sort of had to hold together the international stability of all of our partner nations. Um, do you think that we're going to see the Asian industrial powers actually make the commitment to developing uh, renewable energy infrastructure and 21st century transportation? I think they'll have to, honestly. These things, are, they tend to be forced upon us rather than people sit down and make the effort to do them. Or, you know, people are quite fatalistic. But sometimes things happen and it just, you know, they used to say that New York would be uninhabitable a hundred years, in 1890, a hundred years from now, New York will be uninhabitable because there'll be so many horses, the dung will be up to the 30th floor. <laughs> right? That was the apocalypse of 1895. <laughs> a dung apocalypse. But instead, we got the internal combustion engine and we had other problems to worry about. You know, we were able to clear, shovel away the dung. Someone will discover coal fusion, someone will discover something, someone will discover a new energy source that gives us massive amounts of zero point energy. It will probably happen. I don't know if it will happen in our lifetimes, but it will, it will have to happen in the same way that the population will either have to come down or we're going to have to start moving them into space because we, we just do not have the resources to deal with 8 billion people. The planet can't really sustain that, you know, you can't have, you say, oh, let's have a thousand wind farms, but wind doesn't make plastic, you know, oil makes plastic and we rely so much on plastic that it's going to be really difficult when the plastic runs out. So there's a, there's a lot of things that we're going to have to deal with, but I tend to find that people, people do deal with it because they find that they have to deal with it, it becomes imperative. So yeah, I think, it's li and it's likely to come from cultures that at least have a vision of the future. Now, Gotham, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, too. I know you live in some of these areas. I, well, yeah, and we, we could have a whole other panel in terms of where it's going. Look, I think, you know, the biggest challenges that we're facing in Asia is consumption. So while I hope they are the solution, um, right now they continue to be sort of the problem. And I think there's a sort of attitude in that country, which is, you know, in this country, we've, we've had our time. And now India and China are sort of these rising powers, and you have rising middle classes, and you have people who finally have the resources to buy products and washing machines and cars, and they are. I mean, if you live there, I mean, it takes Sherrod almost as long to drive to the airport as it does to fly here to Los Angeles or to <laughs> San Diego. So, um, you know, I think, you know, we are facing some problems, but generally it's you know, we take quantum leaps. And you're certainly seeing that in places like India. And Trot touched on it briefly, but you see people taking these quantum leaps, going in villages from never having a phone to having 4G connectivity. And so, yeah, I do think the likelihood of finding some of these solutions out of Asia is, is high. But I see a lot of questions. So I want to make sure we keep Thank going. Thanks much. for the question. Uh, oh, yeah. Hi, Grant. Uh, a lot of your works from JLA to Invisibles to All-Star Superman very much revolve around the idea of humanity being able to overcome its problems, being able to live up to its ideals, and 18 days ends with everyone dying. And, you know, it's very much about the decline of man, mm -hmm. of apocalypse. Would you say there's kind of representing a change of heart there? No, not at all, and because at the heart of it is basically if you listen to this story and you understand what it says, it doesn't have to happen again. You know, it's almost in the way that, they, you know, in Christianity, Jesus died for your sins. These guys died for our sins. They fought the ultimate war, it cracked the earth, and it kind of paved the way. But it also left a message, the Bhagavad Gita, this cosmic message, and Krishna basically says, this is the message for the Dark Age. And if the Dark Age understands this message, then we get out of the Dark Age. And I think that's still sound, and it's why this is such a great story, because, yeah, we all will have to deal with crap. We all deal with our own personal apocalypses as people die in our lives, as our own bodies decay, and we eventually, too, will face this complete collapse. You know, the, the disintegration of the great machine will occur. That's all in the story. You know, the story doesn't pull its punches on those elements of human experience, but ultimately it says that if you learn this lesson, it won't happen this way again. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I really appreciate all that you have said. I'm just a simple mining girl from the West, a pioneer, and I was thrilled about the the, art, the mention of the nine husbands, or five husbands, <laughs> five husbands. Okay. Anyway. What so I'm, many of you had. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm also an, interested about is, and I've always wondered this, how does food ever enter into 
all of the storytelling because I know if I eat certain foods, I'll dream and my mm -hmm. imagination goes beyond. Does that ever happen in your writing? Are there certain foods or things that will incite you to write what you write? Uh, magic like mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, honestly, I actually haven't had any mushrooms for a long time, but yeah, I mean, those always seem to work for me. and. Yeah. Uh, as Eating coal will keep you awake all night as well. <laughs> I was going to say, if you find us at like 10 o'clock later at the Hilton, you'll see our collective creativity at work at the bar. Um, but, <clears throat> no, I've, I've actually never thought about specific food because I know you have certain things you can take that will give you pretty vivid, crazy dreams, but I have pretty vivid, crazy dreams anyway. You know, The last thing I need is to enhance that. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Comic-Con is so always unpredictable, isn't yeah. it? Like, I mean, in 25 years, you've never had that question. Never, ever. Yeah. It's just a new question. Saurav, we have a familiar I face. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan of your work. I even wrote a paper about your work and connection to Eastern mysticism. Uh, one of the questions I had was that someone who grew up with the tale of Mahabharata, there is a, you talked about the recursive nature of it with the concentric shells of storytelling, mm -hmm. which Thanks for covering that. <laughs> the other thing great about Mahabharata is that it is a very recursive Rashomon type narrative. Yeah. In that it's the guy who tells the story as a character, mm -hmm. and it's the story of his family, and it's written by someone else. And uh, Bhagavad Gita exists inside the account of Mahabharata, mm -hmm. with the war. And the war is actually being narrated by someone who has been gifted with the sight yeah. and is narrating it to a blind king. So uh, this kind of like self-referential, and I know your uh, your work mm -hmm. explores metafiction <coughs> sigils a lot. Yeah. So my question was about: uh, Did you uh, obviously this is more action-oriented? Mm -hmm. So did you have space to explore those kinds of like the loops, the storytelling loops in this? Yeah, we've we've got a bit of that because it, as you say, it's quite important to it, and I wanted to have the depth. You know, we we start with Mark Andea, the you know yeah. the the sage who's kind of a machine version telling part of the story and then we kind of go into the story and then we get the story told from different points of view. So yeah, I think that's a very much an important part of it. And because you have such a wide cast, it allows us you know, to take Karna's side for a little bit or then to move to the opposite side and, and see what Arjuna's up to. But to honor those characters in their own right as well and to, to show this war through their eyes. So yeah, I think that's, that's a very important part of the, of the whole story. And we're trying to do something with that. Thank you. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question. Well, oh, I was enjoying that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Grant. Hey, uh, how you doing? Nadine from Dublin, so delighted to see you here. How are you doing? Um, I'm, am I the only one who's freaked out about the idea of the five husbands? I think that's far too much hustle. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, my question is actually for... It's okay, they're always away fighting wars. You know? <laughs> Maybe not the right ones, yeah. I don't know. Um, my question is actually though for Jared and Gotham, if that's okay. Um, I'm just wondering what you feel like, like having grown up with these stories, especially Gotham, considering who your dad is. Uh, I'm sure, what's it like to have this white Scottish bloke come up and, and write about these stories and, and even change them slightly? So I wonder how you feel about that. I mean, I'll answer it first, and then obviously Gotham can, can jump in. I mean, this is, uh, at first, not only did we grow up with these stories, we probably grew up with so much of the great creative stories of people like Grant and others. So having someone of his creativity probably knows the Mahabharat better than I would ever know it. I will say he has studied it with such reverence and has brought such a unique kind of lens to it. And it's almost the uniqueness of stepping outside of it that he can kind of bring something unique to it in some way, because he hasn't lived with it the way that we have. Uh, you know, so, so I, I mean, it's a dream come true. I could say this is truly the synthesis of, uh, of a lifelong passion to be able to have this story come to the world with this synthesis of East meets West and all of those great creators in India working with Grant to do this. You know, and also in Scotland, we're not really white, we're more kind of blue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I actually feel quite close to Krishna in this Very story. <laughs> Yeah, so I know we're almost out of time, but look, we desperately need to shake up the establishment. I mean, we desperately need to, and I'm, I'm dead serious. I mean, I think traditional institutional religion has hijacked, literally and figuratively, the wisdom traditions of the world. So I'm not just, you know... So being able to bring someone with such brilliance as Grant... Um, into this 
endeavor, and it's more than just you know something we're putting on YouTube. It's where we're challenging people to try to rethink you know the way in which they see the world because we have to. We have to. You know, I'm very proud to say I married a Chinese woman. We're both American. Uh, I'm getting a stop sign, but we're creating. We you know have a six-year-old son who's a Chinese American Indian. We call him the Chindian, and we we say <laughs> he's. He's, he's the master race, right? Where we've <laughs> manufacturing the world is changing. The complexion of the world is changing in front of our very eyes. So, you know, I, I couldn't be more excited, more grateful to Grant, but also to everybody here, 